welcome Eduardo Lago, Ann Landsman, Jose Manuel Prieto, Salman Rushdie, Rushdie and Adam Gopnik. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Let me quickly introduce. Uh, let me quickly introduce everybody who's up here so you know a little bit about them, and then we'll start our conversation. And Lansman is originally born in South Africa. She's the author of, among other, uh, among other works, the novels The Devil's Chimney and The Rowing Lesson, uh, for which she won the 2009 Sunday Times uh, Fiction Prize, in which my friend uh, Luke Manan described as uh, an adventure in language which makes art of a life. Uh, Jose uh, Manuel Prieto uh, was born in Havana, Cuba. Uh, he studied in Mexico. He's been the recipient of many fellowships and has uh, written uh, very widely, perhaps his best known book is the beautifully titled, uh, in French at least, uh, Papillon de Nuit dans l'Empire de Russie, The Butterflies of Night in the Russian Empire, one of the most beautiful titles and books of the last decade. Um, Eduardo Lago is originally uh, from Spain uh, and has been in America for a very long time without ever yet quite becoming a US citizen, as we will as we'll discuss. Uh, he is, uh, as well as being a, a novelist of great repute, he is also a leading Joycean, one of uh, uh, the, certainly of not just the Spanish-speaking worlds, but the world's leading uh, authorities and uh, amateurs of the works of James Joyce, which we will talk about, as well as Salman Rushdie, uh, who invented this festival, for which we're all grateful, is a writer who is in need of no introduction, but I will uh, quickly uh, supply one by saying that his most recent books include if you'll forgive me, uh, Fury, uh, Shalimar the Clown, and the wonderful The Enchantress of Florence. Welcome to you all, and it's wonderful to be here. I thought we'd start off by talking a bit, since what the commonality that we're announcing and discussing today is being from elsewhere and coming here. If we would talk a bit or actually read a little bit about our first experience of America or New York, I am a peculiar kind of emigre. I'm a Canadian emigre. And Canadian emigres uh, regard their immigration as from a first world country to a third world country when they come, uh, when they come to America. Uh, but let me read you just something I wrote in my book, Through the Children's Gate, about seeing New York for the first time. My parents brought me here for the opening of the Guggenheim Museum uh, many a year ago. For the Guggenheim occasion, I wrote, my mother had sewn a suit of mustard-colored velvet for me and a matching dress for my sister. And we stood in line outside the corkscrew building, trying to remember what we had been taught about Alexander Calder. Afterwards, we marched down the ramp of the amazing museum and then walked along Fifth Avenue, where we saw a Rolls Royce. We ate dinner at a restaurant that served a thrilling, exotic mix of blintzes and insults. And that night, we slept in my great aunt Hannah's apartment at Riverside Drive and 115th Street, a perfect day, and I haven't had as good a one since. I remember looking out the window of the little maid's room where we had been installed seeing the lights of the Palisades across the way, and thinking, there, there it is, over there. There's New York, this wonderful city. I'll go stay there someday. Even being in New York, the actual place, I found the idea of New York so wonderful that I could only imagine it as some other place, greater than any place that would actually let me sleep in it, a distant constellation of lights that I had not yet been allowed to visit. I had arrived in Oz only to think, well, you don't really live in Oz, do you? That remains my fundamental experience of emigration, the notion of a, of a shining, a shimmering other place, which remains a shimmering other place while you actually inhabit the dull and dirty and disappointing real place uh, that they have put in its place as an attempt to substitute on you. Uh, Anne, uh, you first saw New York or first saw America when and in what, in what circumstances? Just to Move one microphone along. Uh, yes, of course. Yeah, there we go. Good, good point. Um, by the way, Salman, I just want to congratulate you because India uh, beat South Africa today in cricket. Just thought I'd add that in. <laughs> um, I'm a little chagrined. But um, I first saw New York City in 1981. Um, and uh, my previous notions of America had been um, from the library I'd grown up with. It was sort of, a, my parents had a big collection of American Jewish uh, fiction as well as uh, a vinyl record called You Don't Have to Be Jewish. <laughs> so uh, this, this... This was a collection of Jewish jokes? And collection of Jewish jokes. American jokes. Jewish jokes. American Henny Young Jewish Min, jokes. Myron Cohen, that kind yes, of thing. Yes, yes, yes. So I kind of grew up with this... Uh, 
um, album, You Don't Have to Be Jewish, and I learned from this album what, not really what an egg cream was, but there was a, a joke in there, uh, um, and there was a character called, character called uh, James Bonstein, um, <laughs> and he went into a deli and asked for an egg cream. Anyway, so um, <laughs> so that was the, the record I grew up with. I also grew up with uh, Marjorie Morningstar. I guess that dates me hugely. <laughs> Um, and she was this, I'm sure you know Herman Works. Herman Works. Uh, sort of she was trying to pass Morgan Stern, and who takes the name of Morgan Stern. <laughs> right. So, um, but she, she grew up on Central Park West and, uh, you know, wanted to live in Greenwich Village and all of that. Um, uh, and sort of fell in love with a very dashing uh, playwright, Noel Ehrman, uh, but eventually marries the nice Jewish boy her parents w wanted to marry anyway. So these were all my fantasies of New York. Um, and then when I came, it was, you know, some, some other very hot, dirty, uh, difficult place. Um, the first day here, I remember I had a huge backpack and the place I was supposed to stay in, it, no one was there. And I waited endlessly with my giant backpack and eventually, um, you know, with uh, 5,000 quarters, called South Africa and found a place for the night uh, with a friend of my mother's from way back when, uh, Gloria Pelzik, who had been a, um, who was a widowed uh, New York City school teacher. And I always think of, Gloria Pelzig as my own personal uh, Statue of Liberty. So uh, I spent the night in her apartment mm -hmm. and um, you know, many adventures later, um, you know, I came to, to be a New Yorker, to go to graduate school here. Um, and the section that I'd like to read from my novel, if I may, uh, The Rowing Lesson, is um, the main character in the book, Betsy Klein, lives in New York City and she's visited by her father, Harry Klein. And um, she, he, they're up on the roof of her loft on Bond Street. She's a painter, and he, she's just showed him some of her artwork in her painting studio. And um, so they're walking around on this tar-covered roof. And uh, what I really want you to think about in this section is the fact that she's now living in New York City, and he's this, this father from another place, this person from another culture. And there's a big cultural difference now between father and daughter. He's been a country doctor in a small town in South Africa for most of his life. And um, he's struggling to make sense of this, this daughter who's become something else. And the novel um, is told in the second person. So the you is, is Betsy's voice, the daughter, and um, the, the person she's talking to and about is her father, Harry Klein. So they're up on the roof. Um, you got up to look over the edge of the low parapet wall. Somebody's going to have a terrible accident, you say, backing away. You know, ever since my fall, my shoulder's never been the same. Vrachtach, that was something. I was at Chucky van der Merwe's house examining one of the kids who had chicken pox, and I was just on my way out of the door. One minute I'm standing, and the next minute I'm on my ass, twisted sideways in their bloody conversation pit. I knew I'd fractured something. It hurt like hell. Your face was riven with melancholy. It's hard when an old person falls, you sigh. You sighed. Old burns take a long time to heal, and they're never the same again. Did you know I have Paget's disease? What's that? I said airily, staring up at the empty sky. My spine is turning into bamboo, for Christ's sake. Wait, you said, let me take a picture of you up here. You took your camera out of the old leather case around your neck. Stand over there, you told me. Not near the edge, for God's sake. Your mother wants lots and lots of pictures. Damn it, there's something wrong with the mechanism. Dad, I said, waving my hand in front of my face. You're just like your mother, impatient as hell. This camera is not as good as my old one. Hang on, chaps. Let's get those towers in the background. They look like giant tuning forks. <laughs> so, uh, there's another tiny little section Please. if we have time. Um, so also uh, sort of what's um, noteworthy about the story and also about my own experience that I was raised by parents who grew up on Damon Runyon stories. So um, in, this, in the same novel, uh, Betsy takes her father to see uh, Guys and Dolls on, um, at the Martin Beck Theatre on 45th Street, and he's ecstatic because he's you know, grown up in South Africa, and the idea of actually seeing a play on Broadway and seeing Guys and Dolls is thrilling to him. Um, and you sort of have to hear in this section um, the sense of what it must have been like in the 40s as South Africa was entering into a very different reality to, um, to you know, have Damon Runyon intersect with that, okay? So two nights before you left, I took you to see Guys and Dolls at the Martin Beck Theater on 45th Street in the dazzling heart of the city. 
I wore big earrings, a swingy black dress, my hair pulled back. You sat tilted forward on the edge of your seat as Nathan Lane and Faith Prince sang and danced the Damon Runyon stories of your youth. Bloody marvelous, you said to me at intermission, the high beams of your enthusiasm shining right at me. I can't believe I'm here, my girl. You did me a big favor. A wave of feeling spread across your features, black eyes softening, a rueful smile catching at me. Harry the horse, nicely, nicely Johnson, Mindy's restaurant. Maxie knew pages and pages off by heart. Me and him and Mickey Levine used to go to, well, never mind, before your time. Still, District 6 was full of all kinds of characters. It's all gone now. Those bastards bulldozed the life out of Cape Town. Your mother and I saw it coming. It was not long after the war when the nationalists came into power and the signs went up, blunkers, knee blunkers, whites, non-whites. Well, it's all changing again. Who knows what's going to happen? It's bloody fas fascinating, though. I just hope I lo live long enough to see the Fakrumpters Fakrumpt. It means the conservatives squished. <laughs> it, it's wonderful to think that the American musical acts as such a beacon. Salman, I think of the wonderful essay you wrote about uh, the Wizard of Oz in your own, in the making of your own mind, and the guys and dolls acted as an image of the New York at, 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 from a South African distance. Jose, you come to us from Cuba originally. Is that on? Uh, yes, um, I am, um, I think I'm the, the most, the youngest immigrant here, because I just came like five years ago. Um, but um, I came um, originally, I'm from Cuba, but I came fr fr uh, from Mexico. And uh, before that I was living in Russia, so I'm a, uh, an immigrant with uh, a long experience. But, <laughs> but for, uh, for my first time I came to New York like um, 10 years ago, but then I, we moved uh, like five years ago. Um, was, um, for me it was always very intriguing uh, how America will be because when I was born in Cuba, I uh, was grow up, in, when I grew up in Cuba, all the time we were like enemies, you know, of Cuba and the uh, United States. So the first time I came, uh, I remember I was very surprised. I wrote a, a, an article about, an essay about this. Uh, it's called um, Cuban Revolution Explained uh, to Taxi Drivers. <laughs> because <laughs> I was very surprised uh, by the popularity of uh, Cuban Revolution and Fidel Castro. Um, it, with um, ca taxi drivers in New York. I took the taxi all the time. Uh, they would say, oh, where are, for our, where are you? Uh, I'm, I'm from Cuba. Oh, Fidel Castro. Cuba. So mm -hmm. for me, it was a little bit. <laughs> so, um, so I wrote this article, like trying to explain them uh, why I am not uh, a little bit uh, agree in some aspect with them. So, but the moment it's, uh, uh, the, the, is that when I was uh, gr growing up in Cuba, I, um, I also uh, was always uh, like reading uh, American authors, novels, and that like, uh, that, like uh, helped to shape the, the view of, of this country that was our enemy. And um, I wrote something, oh, it was presented as our enemy, of course. But I wrote something about how literature uh, helped me to uh, figure out uh, and have to like another idea of, and this um, also happened here in New York like a few um, years ago. I met, um, I was a, a, few, a brief in, uh, uh, meeting encounter with um, uh, Norman Mailer, and um, I, this is something I am, uh, I wrote um, this uh, short few, pa few pages. I would like to read it, and uh, the title of this. Um, pieces, American books I read as a child in Castro's Cuba. This in the summer of 2007, I was invited to a dinner that the Paris Review organized in the city of New York in honor of Norman Mailer. The novelist has recently published what will be his last novel, The Castle in the Forest. I would hold a conversation with E. L. Doctorow. I went with the grand illusion of listening to these two great American writers they would speak about their most recent books. Nevertheless, what I did not yet know was the uh, thanks to the, New York, um, the University of Friends, I would share the table with Norman Mailer himself. So when I saw him enter the room and come up to our table with his very recognizable demeanor, 
that of a man once trapped in a square, but uh, who was now supporting himself with two canes. Was, I was very surprised and happy. I stood up to greet him, and after responding to me with a rapid gesture of his head, he asked me to take his two canes, beautifully adorned with silver handles, and I rushed them, he looked around there by the window, something to which I happily obliged. During the dinner that followed his electrifying dialogue with Doctor, I had the opportunity to speak with him. I spoke about what else do you say in that case? About my admiration for these books that I began to read when I was very young. At the center of the table were some copies of his novel, courtesy for, of the publishers, and I asked him to aut autograph a copy of The Naked and the Dead, which he kindly did. While he signed it, I mentioned it to him how much reading this book in particular as a boy in Cuba had impacted me. He grumbled something calculating in which year it ought to have been. Yes, he admits. It is a powerful book for teens, and he authored it for me plainly, for Jose, etc. That was all. About the dinner, nothing else was particularly memorable. I returned with the copy which I placed next to my most precious books in my living room. Days later, I had some people over for dinner and I showed my friend the autographed copy. He asked me a question that left me a bit perplexed. But how, he reacted, you read Norman Mailer in Cuba? And I add, I would guess that American writers were prohibiting on the island. His commentary took me by surprise and I couldn't understand the reason for it till I figured out what he meant. My friend had imagined, perhaps logically, that literature from the United States was not allowed to circulate in Cuba, that what prohibited literature seen at both countries were more or less at war, openly proclaimed enemies. I explained to him passionately that something like that never occurred, and that my books and those of many others American houses had never been censored in Cuba. In that, in that sense. So he, co he commented he had the vision, nevertheless, of making me reflect upon the impact of the literature of our neighbor, the United States, about how these books that had, had crossed the border of censorship and political mishaps. I meditated also on the many books by American authors that I read as a child in Cuba, and uh, that uh, the way th that literature uh, had uh, on my literary formation. I'm thinking about authors like Hemingway, William Faulkner, Carson McCuller, William Sarian, uh, um, Sherwood Artisan, and others. But, um, um, so, um, the, the most important thing, uh, the most important uh, point uh, I, I wanted to, I want to do with, with this article is about how uh, the, I was in, in that atmosphere of propaganda indoctrination, and how literature should help me me to um, like like an antidote, not to be uh, poisoned uh, uh, to big extent. So that's um, that's only I want to say. So literature is an antidote to the poison of propaganda. Was your first was your first experience of it? Someone like like Jose, you you're a kind of multiple immigrant in 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 a sense of of this time you came to the United States not simply from your uh, original background from India, but also by way of that second world nation of uh, of of England and of Great Britain. Um, what were your first experiences and your your first take on America? One of the things I'm noticing is, is that people have an, an image, an idea implanted yes. in their heads before they arrive here, and in, inevitably it becomes a comparative moment. Well, if I could just begin by answering your Canadian belittlement <laughs> um, with one in return. I remember <laughs> Robin Williams saying that Canada was like this really beautiful apartment upstairs from a great party. <laughs> 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 but you know, what do people do in the upstairs apartment when the they raid party is going the floor. on down They have her on the floor, of course. You know what you use the apartment for. <laughs> yeah. <You> go. <laughs> yeah, anyway. um, I, uh, of course, one of the, 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 the things about, about the all-pervasiveness of American culture is that, is that you feel you know 
America before you ever come here. You know, that, that, I mean, I grew up in Bombay listening to early rock and roll, you know, listening to Bill Haley and Elvis Presley and, and going to, in those days, the movie theaters in Bombay, much more than they are now, were actually tied to Hollywood studios. So there's a movie theater called the Metro, which would show MGM the RKO first, or whatever. First release films, yeah. you know, musicals, all that, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, all that stuff. You know, there was a cinema called The New Empire, which showed 20th Century Fox <laughs> films. There was a cinema called The Eros, which showed Paramount films. So you had a very contemporary awareness of American cinema. And of course, just particularly New York City is so much represented um, that when you first come to New York, you have this very odd double feeling that everything is familiar, but you don't know your way around. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. Every building you look at, you think, oh, sure. But then you don't know how to get where you're going. You know? um, so, so that double familiarity, unfamiliarity, I think, for a lot of us coming here, uh, was it. I mean, I came in the early 70s for the first time in a very different New York City. I had a college friend from Cambridge, an American friend who, had, who invited me to come and stay. And he had been, uh, he's a Russian scholar and in many ways very brilliant man, but when I knew him at Cambridge, he was rampantly heterosexual. In the meantime, he had discovered that he was in fact rampantly homosexual. <laughs> and so he invited me to stay at this apartment house that he had in St. Mark's. And when I arrived, it was full of gay Cuban refugees. <laughs> <laughs> not, not including Jose. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, and so that was like my first day in New York, was surrounded by gay Cubans called Raul shaving themselves <laughs> in mirrors, etc. <laughs> and, and then he took me to a meeting of an organization which I think is now defunct called the Greater, Greater Gotham Business League, which was the organization of gay business people in New York, which Ed Koch had come to address. And the big question was whether anybody would out him or not. And of course they didn't, um, but I just did. <laughs> Glad to say, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I guess the most poignant moment of those first days was I remember my friend saying to me that this bar had just opened very, very high up downtown. And you know, we should go there. And this was the windows on the world. And, and I remember him saying, there's just one thing, you have to wear a suit and tie. And I said, what, you have to wear a suit and tie to go to a bar? <laughs> You know, I had long hair, in the, I had hair in those days. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I had like a Zapata moustache. And I, the idea of wearing a suit was, you know, against my religion. So, but he said, no, you really should because it's worth it. So on like my first, I can't remember if it was the first or second night in New York, I was taken up to the windows of the world. And so that became, you know, a very indelible early memory. Yeah. And of course, that was at such a different New York because it was, you know, it was dangerous. I mean, I remember my uptown friends, when I told them I was staying on St. Mark's Place, they looked at me and they said, Salman, you have to leave today. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I said, what, you mean because of the crack dealers on the doorstep? And they said, no, no, you don't understand. You have to move out now. Well, I didn't. Because, of course, the point about the crack dealers is once they realize you haven't got any money, they're fine. You know, then they're kind of friendly. Like real estate um, brokers. They're yeah. Really in the, in the yeah. But, you know, you had to learn these strange pathways through the city because there was a block that was safe and a block that was... So you couldn't necessarily walk in a straight line. You had to sort of do that, you know, to get across town without being mugged. And I remember going to see... I have a very vivid memory of going to see John Borman's film of Excalibur in Times Square in the days when Times Square was entirely African-American. And so in this movie theater, the, that was the only non-African-American person in the movie theater. They were treating it like kind of medieval Star Wars. Mm -hmm. you know, so every time King Arthur would go for, his, go for Excalibur, there would be cries in the movie theater of, give him the sword, man, <laughs> hit him with the sword. <laughs> as, as if it was like a lightsaber, you know? <laughs> Which in a way it was. So, so that was... That was that my was first. That, that was, was my your arrival. That was your first yeah. New York. Did, did you have a, a yeah? This is to a, read from I, mean, from us? I mean, much later when I actually came to live here, which was about eleven years ago now, I ended up writing this novel, Fury, which was oddly. I mean, it's written about the summer of two thousand. Uh, it had the strange fate of being published on September eleven, two thousand and one, and thus becoming a historical novel on the day it was published. And and what I thought I could do in that book 
I didn't, I, I know that I'm not able to write about New York in the way that a native New Yorker would write about it, and I would not wish to try, you know. Um, but I thought I could write about the phenomenon of arrival, because one of the things I think is, is remarkable about this city is how quickly it lets you become a New Yorker. You know, you could be here for a week, and a week later, your story is a New York story. You know, um, and, and so I thought, I wanted to write about that New York, the New York of endless arrival. You know? And so I just wanted to read two very, very brief bits. One is, uh, one is a bit about American advertising, which of course is now very much the kind of visual environment that we live in. And I used to work in advertising, so I have my own contempt for it. Um, um, and this is about, the, the narrator of this is a person sort of like myself, my age and so on, but much, much grumpier than me. Mm -hmm. And, and he's, uh, he's walking around New York and his first wife, his ex-wife, is a big shot in, in the advertising business and he doesn't much care for her. Um, he says she was probably right here in town. She would be in her late 50s now, a big shot with a booming portfolio, the secret booking numbers for Pastis and Nobu, and a weekend place south of the highway in probably Amagansett. Thank heavens there was no need to track her down, look her up, or congratulate her on her life choices. How she would have crowed, for they had lived long enough to witness the absolute victory of advertising. Back in the 70s, when she gave up the serious life for the frivolous, working in Adland had been slightly shameful. You confessed it to your friends with lowered voice and downcast eyes. Advertising was a confidence trick, a cheat, the notorious enemy of promise. It was, the horrible thought in that era, nakedly capitalist. Selling things was low. Now everyone, eminent writers, great painters, architects, politicians, wanted to be in on the act. Reformed alcoholics plugged booze. Everybody, as well as everything, was for sale. Advertisements had become colossi, clambering like Kong up the walls of buildings. What's more, they were loved. When he was watching TV, he still turned the sound down at commercial breaks, but everyone else, he was sure, turned it up. The girls in the ads, Esther, Bridget, Elizabeth, Hallie, Giselle, Tyra, Isis, Aphrodite, Kate, were more desirable than the actresses in the shows in between. The guys in the ads, Mark Vandaloo, Marcus Schenkenberg, Marcus Aurelius, Mark Antony, Marky Mark, <laughs> were more desirable than the actresses in the shows. And as well as presenting the dream of an ideally beautiful America in which all women were babes and all men were marks, after doing the basic work of selling pizza and SUVs and I can't believe it's not butter, uh, <laughs> beyond money management and the new dit 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 of the dot coms, the commercials soothed America's pain, its head pain, its gas pain, its heartache, its loneliness, the pain of babyhood and old age, of being a parent and of being a child, the pain of manhood and women's pain, the pain of success and that of failure, the good pain of the athlete and the bad pain of the guilty, the anguish of loneliness and of ignorance, the needle-sharp torment of the cities and the dull, mad ache of the empty plains, the pain of wanting without knowing what was wanted, the agony of the howling void within each watching, semi-conscious self. No wonder advertising was popular. It made things better. It showed you the road. It wasn't a part of the problem. It solved things. Mm. The other little bit is he has an encounter with a taxi driver. Um, it's a bit, there's a lot of bad language in this bit, sorry. Islam will cleanse this street of godless motherfucker bad drivers, the taxi driver screamed at a rival motorist. Islam will purify this whole city of Jew pimp assholes like you and your whore road hog of a Jew wife too. All the way up 10th Avenue, the curses continued. Infidel fucker of your underage sister, the inferno of Allah awaits you and your unholy wreck of a motor car as well. Unclean offspring of a shit-eating pig, try that again, and the victorious jihad will crush your balls in its unforgiving fist. Malik Solanka, listening in to the explosive village-accented Urdu, was briefly distracted from his own inner turmoil by the driver's venom. Ali Majnu, said the card. Majnu meant beloved. 
This particular beloved looked 25 or less, a nice handsome boy, tall and skinny with a sexy John Travolta quiff. And here he was living in New York with a steady job. What had so comprehensively gotten his goat? Solanka silently answered his own question. When one is too young to have accumulated the bruises of one's own experience, one can choose to put on like a hair shirt the sufferings of the world. In this case, as the Middle East peace process staggered onwards and the, on, and, the, and the outgoing American president, hungry for a breakthrough to buff up his tarnished legacy, was urging Barack and Arafat to a, to a Camp David summit conference. 10th Avenue was perhaps being blamed for the continued sufferings of Palestine. Beloved Ali was Indian or Pakistani, but no doubt out of some misguided collectivist spirit of paranoiac pan-Islamic solidarity, he blamed all New York road users for the tribulations of the Muslim world. In between curses, he spoke to his mother's brother on the radio. Yes, uncle. Yes, carefully, of course, uncle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, the car costs money. No, uncle, courteously. Yes, always, uncle, trust me. Yes, best policy, I know. And also asked Salanka sheepishly for directions. It was his first day at work in the mean streets, and he was scared witless. Solanka himself, in a state of high agitation, treated Beloved gently, but did say, as he alight alighted, maybe a little less of the blue language, okay, Ali Majnu? Tone it down. Some customers might be offended, even those who don't understand. <laughs> the boy looked at him blankly. I, sir? Swearing, sir? When? <laughs> this was odd. All the way, Solanka explained, at everyone within shouting distance, motherfucker, Jew, the usual repertoire. Urdu, he added, in Urdu, to make things clear, meri madri zaban hai. Urdu is my mother tongue. <laughs> Beloved blushed deeply, the color spreading all the way to his collar line, and met Solanka's gaze with bewildered, innocent, dark eyes. Saab, if you heard it, then it must be so. But sir, you see, I am not aware. Zelenka lost patience, turned to go. Doesn't matter, he said. Road rage, you were carried away, it's not important. As he walked off along Broadway, beloved Ali shouted after him needily, asking to be understood. It means nothing, sir. Me, I don't even go to the mosque. God bless America, okay? It's just words. <laughs> no, wonderful, thank you. Um, Eduardo, we've heard about the idea of America as an antidote to propaganda, and in Salman talking about uh, America as a kind of all-purpose analgesic where everything is cured or pretended to be by advertising. Um, what was your first sense of the idea of America and then of the reality that you encountered? In the green room a few minutes ago, one of us said, well, because we are all immigrants, and I said, but uh, I am not an immigrant. Mm -hmm. um, and that I have, I have still not decided whether I'm going to live in New York or not. Um, it all began in 1985. I was <laughs> traveling in Asia, and, I, and every day in the morning I went for breakfast uh, in a hotel in Kathmandu, and there was a very big photograph of the Bay of Hong Kong. So I was all by myself in the dining room, and I would look at the photograph and, and said to myself, and I don't know why, I think that one day I'm going to go to New York and live there. So in <laughs> so that became something very important to me, and uh, in 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 1987, I took a leave of absence from my job as a teacher in Madrid, and no, I didn't take it yet. In 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 the spring, in the Christmas break, in the winter break, I came to New York to see what I mean to try and understand that odd feeling. <coughs> And I was going through a very difficult personal time. And um, so all inside myself, I was totally crazy and nervous and in anguish permanently. And when I came to the city, this was the image that I had. Everything around me was madness and I was calm mm -hmm. inside. So I think I have to live here. So it, it, it was right. So it, it, then I took my leave of absence. Because you could express your own calm in the midst of this much craziness. It, something like that. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. I came here, I took a leave of absence, and I began to live here. Uh, I spent like um, less than a year. And then ever since, I have never made a decision about staying or going. I could never make a decision. When I was uh, eight months into my first, uh, I mean, uh, in the spring of 88, 
somebody who was the, the, the son of exiles from the Spanish Civil War and who was a dean at City College called me and he had left a few messages in my answering machine and I totally neglected them. So one day he caught me and he said, Eduardo, normally people call me to ask me for favors. But this is the first time I have to call somebody three times to try and make them a favor. <laughs> Will you do me the favor to come in and see me? And I said, oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so all he had to tell me is that, listen, I, I, I heard about you. I know what you do. And some friends, I mean, they were all writers. They tell me that I should try and help you because it doesn't make any sense that you go back to Madrid. You should live in the city. And I think that you could do a, a PhD at the City University of New York. I, th I think it would be wonderful for you. So I left the office of this man and said, why would I do a PhD? No, and this, I was 30, 32 or 33. I don't want to study. I did all that a long time ago. I don't want to do that. I want to continue with my own life in, in different ways, having fun, going out every single night, and things like that. But then I thought about it carefully, and he had said something to me. He said, well, it's, if you do that, if you are a good student, and you finish your PhD, you can live in New York. And I thought it was a very good idea. Mm -hmm. So just for the sake of staying in New York, I decided to pursue my doctoral studies. <laughs> and uh, one day I was in Brooklyn College uh, where I was an adjunct uh, teacher. I was about to finish my dissertation and uh, I got another phone call from the same guy. And he said, his name is Manuel de la Nuez. And he said, Eduardo, something very important happened. Can we make an appointment? Uh, is what, what happened? And he said, I was doing the laundry yesterday in the basement of my building in Brooklyn Heights, and I met with this person who is in the committee of, uh, at Sarah Lawrence College. You know Sarah Lawrence College, of course. And I said, no, no <laughs> I don't know Sarah Lawrence. What is that? The college, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you know what? This was June. Um, the Spanish teacher just resigned, and they have nobody for the fall. And they are desperate. It's, uh, would you mind going there and meeting with them? They have a go so I think I was dressed like you said before. I mean, with my, I mean, in a not very elegant, not a tight. So I went there and I saw a very serious group of people talking to me, all you know, very formal. And I found out on the spot it was the president of the college, the dean of the college, and the members of the advisory committee who interviewed me and began to ask me all kinds of questions about my formation and what I had, uh, whether I was working, uh, I mean, my, the, the topic of my dissertation, and et cetera. And I, I just answered their questions. I wanted to know my ideas about literature, whether uh, how I enjoyed my teaching and all that. When I arrived home at that time in Williamsburg, when Williamsburg was not fa fashionable at all, there was a call from the dean of the college and said, Eduardo, this is Barbara Kaplan, dean of the college. Uh, we would like you to offer the position. Uh, and uh, so I called back, and um, she said a figure. I said, no, that's too little money. I'm not interested <laughs> in that. And she said, what if I double that? And I said, well, that sounds more interesting. <laughs> so I, I accepted the so, job. So just like that? Just yeah. like that. Wait a minute. There's one last chapter. One, or semi so I spent there my first year, and I happened to like the place very, very much. And then the woman who had uh, left the position had done that. She was from Catalonia, from Barcelona. Did it because her husband had been on the West Coast as president of a community college, I think. And it, it, the commute, uh, the relationship be began to resent the fact of the distance between, you know, coast to coast. So she said, this is permanent. So I applied for the position, and the uh, the, ch the chair of the department said to me, are you interested? And I said, I think I am. I like this place. So I said, well, you're going to see many people applying for the position. So in fact, I saw many people, and I, they gave me the position. And they gave me tenure. And I remember the dean telling me, well, we sponsor you, but you have to do your papers, Eduardo. We are not going, we cannot have you here illegally. So well, I'll, I'll do the papers, don't worry. <laughs> so I did that. So to this day, I remain a, non a non-citizen, and then, the last part of this has to do with my connection with New York as a writer. For reasons that it would be very difficult for me to explain, although I have been always writing since I was eight years old, I never wanted to publish. I, something about the writer's life, I, I love the pen, you know that Salman's idea, I'm a big supporter in my current position, but there's something about 
this that I don't like. I mean, the strong egos, the promotion, the marketing, all of that is something nauseating about that. <laughs> so, so I didn't do anything. But when I was 50, um, I sent my novel to an agent in Barcelona. The novel was about New York, mainly with some going back to Spain in the time of the Civil War. It covers almost a century. And uh, she, she sent the novel and it won, the, it won to, uh, to a... I mean, it won the most prestigious Spanish language award. This is Brooklyn, award. but this is your... Yeah, call, call me Brooklyn. Call me Brooklyn. So I went to see the dean, it was the same person, and I had to explain to her, well, you know, I want this award, they want me to go to Spain to do a promotion, can mm -hmm. somebody take care of my classes? And when I came back from the promotion, the Minister of Culture from Spain said to me, Eduardo, uh, the current uh, director of Instituto Cervantes has resigned and we thought of you. So between 1987 or better, but since I saw that picture about going to Hong Kong to this moment, <laughs> I have not had the time to decide whether I want to live in New York or not. <laughs> you simply, well, that's a wonderful story, right? Because that's what so many of us have experienced. That is, is that though we may think about uh, living in New York, the reality of it is, is that it sort of happens to us instead of us happening to it. But as, as we go around here, what I hear is on the whole a very positive vibe, that is, America, or at least New York, as a place of opportunity and uh, self-transformation, even if we don't plan it, we become professors before we expect to, or fall in love with Linda Evangelista before we, before we know it, or get to see a Broadway, uh, a bro the character, the fictional character, um, before we can do it. And is that, um, after all, the general, the, the classic experience of people coming from the margins of the empire to the imperial capital, is as much a tradition of exile, of feelings of alienation and of loss, as it is of opportunity. Is there something actually different about the American experience, or are we all being a little polite about the degree of exile and alienation that and we I, experience? I don't know about the American Mr. experience. Yeah. I don't know about the American, but New York, I mean, I think it's, it's different, you know? Um, and in the way that I think the great city is often different from the country it's in. You know, London is not like England. Mm -hmm. Paris is not like France. Uh, New York is not like America. Uh, um, and and I, I wanted to live in New York. I didn't mm -hmm. want to live in America. You know, um, it was a specific urban... And actually, one of the reasons is it always reminded me of Bombay. Mm -hmm. I think it does. I mean, even Manhattan Island is about the size and shape mm -hmm. of what is now called South Bombay, which used to be Bombay, which is the island, the, the peninsula sticking into the sea. And... I just felt as that young man arriving here in my 20s, I just had this deep instinct that I should put myself in this place that it would be a good thing to do. You know, it was a very long time in my life before I was able to do that. But it was from that moment in the 20s, in my 20s, that I felt that, just felt the, the great attractor, you know. But in your, in your fiction, Anne, I, I, in, in this book as well, it seems to me, your, your basic take on it, I'm simplifying a bit, is, this is the place where I can remake myself and escape a past in many ways claustrophobic or oppressive, I, rather than yeah. this is the place I've been forced to and I still long for the original, for, the, for my place of origin. Yeah, no, I, I completely connect with that. Um, I suppose for me, you know, there's this excitement about the this cultural diversity um, that never goes away. I mean, there was a front page article in the New York Times this week about the fact that there are more than 800 languages spoken in New York City. Yeah. Um, and I can't still to this day, I read an article like that with the kind of thrill mm -hmm. um, after coming from apartheid South Africa, which was so, uh, you know, when I was growing up, there were such harsh divides. Um, I mean, and of course, not to say that New York is the integrated place we'd like it to be, but for me, the possibility or this notion that 800 languages are spoken in these five boroughs is, you know, still thrilling. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, it, you know, with, with all the, you know, difficulty and complexity, it's funny, when um, there were moments when, when all of you were talking that I had various um, connections, because I also lived on <laughs> St. Mark's Place, um, and, you know, there are definitely still moments of, of alienation. Um, you know, I came, for instance, from a, a place of, of real political challenge, but great natural beauty. So when I first came to New York, I 
kept looking for the mountains behind the skyscrapers. I kept thinking, you've got to be kidding. Mm -hmm. There are no mountains. I mean, there's the buildings, but where are the mountains? Um, and in no natural way, landscape behind yes, the and, and, you know, urban Cape Town landscape. is right. uh, extraordinary that way. And the, the little town I grew up in, which is 70 two miles north of Cape Town, there were always mountains. So I just assumed that every city had some kind of a mountain. Mm -hmm. um, so, so for me, you know, there's, sometimes there's this sort of, I think Naipaul calls it this, the second language of the eyes, that when I'm confronted with a natural landscape, I yearn for my own sort of native flora and fauna, if you, if you, if you will. Um, and I don't have that problem in New York City. So I'm not confronted so much with that natural landscape mm -hmm. that I tend to long for. Okay. Um, everyone just jump in here. This is, there's no particular order, but um, is, there, is there something fundamentally different, though, about coming from a Hispanic uh, uh, background in, this, in two senses? One, the long history, is certainly in, in Cuba and South America, of enmity, oppression, and so on, gives you a very different take on the American reality. And then also, as, you, as you've written about, the reality that New York is in so many ways a Spanish, is in addition to being itself as a Spanish-speaking city, is a city with, which, uh, with, uh, with a huge um, uh, Hispanic presence. Yes, um, for me particularly, to be in New York, uh, it's um, a place to be when I can travel be between uh, the city to many, to all, all the places I used to live. Uh, this uh, this uh, a big Russian um, 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 a community, uh, in Brighton Beach, so you can travel to Brighton. In one day, you can I can be in Bri in Brighton in in Mexico. I can be in Russia, in Mexico, mm -hmm. all other places at the same time. So, uh, for me, that that's a very important. I remember when I w used to live in 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 Mexico with my family, um, my wife from Russia, and then I used to travel to to New York. I would buy many Russian foods from. <laughs> To, and travel ba back to Mexico. <laughs> so now I'm here, so I don't need to do that. So it's very, mm -hmm. like, very more convenient, of course. And also, of course, the, the, the part of Latin America that you can speak um, 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 perfectly Spanish all the time, and all the people will like understand you. And that's very comfortable, I, I think. Uh, and, uh, and you could live a life that way, just speaking Spanish in New York City, if one chose. If I, I think so. Yeah. In some different places, yes, 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 yes. It's possible to do that. I think so. even you have friends from Spain also. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, uh, the things get a little bit more complicated here. It is a very fascinating topic because when I was uh, like telling the story of how I ended up here and it's not a, a result issue, that's more personal as a writer. And what happened, I owe something very big to New York. I owe to New York the fact that I am a writer, that I am a published writer. I don't think it would have happened elsewhere. So there's something in this city that I, I received instantly. The image of madness around me could be translated into some kind of sheer, pure, wonderful energy. And just like John Steinbeck said, after living in New York, no place is good enough. And that is very, very, very true. What we're confronting here about the, with the, about the issue with the language is, I recall a sentence from Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, when they asked him about this and immigration, the language, he said, we didn't come to the United States. The United States came to us. In 19, in came to Colombia as a, as a came to, presence. Came so. to Latin America. Mm -hmm. In 1848, Mexico ceded half of its national territory that, uh, to the United States. Uh, that, that's why the name, San Francisco, California, mm -hmm. all of that, uh, Nevada, Colorado, those are Spanish language words. The first uh, text ever written in what now is the national territory of the United States was written by a Spanish chronicler in Florida, Gaspar Pérez de Villagra, in the 1600s. And um, when that treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed in 1848, enormous amounts of population who only spoke Spanish became automatically part of the landscape. But uh, as I say, this should be the topic of a symposium. But what is uh, going on now is two very important things that I say, and I'm now speaking as the president of Instituto de Cervantes, which is that Spanish language is not, has never been a foreign language in the United States. And this applies to many other circumstances. And, and because of the strength of the flux of, of immigration, now over a quarter of the population speak Spanish, and many of them only Spanish. So this is a very complex issue. Uh, we published a book, which is only in Spanish now, which is titled the, the, Encyclop the Encyclopedia of Spanish in the United States, and it's a 1,200-page volume. 
uh, 80 scholars contributed to it. The idea was born in, in, in my office, and it's the history of movies, theater, and there's a huge, a huge wealth of history. And even I think uh, it's really complicated that it's not, the history of the United States has not written entirely correctly because it has been exclusively written from the point of view of the Anglo-Saxons. And uh, it's not- Massachusetts on in, so it's, to speak. It's not about vindicating mm -hmm. anything, which I don't like that kind of tone or wrong. Or, no, it's just that it is, it is wrong. Look at the missions in California and all those things that happened. So there's something that has not been correctly written. So, so that part of, of your experience is coming to a place in the sense where the history needs to be rewritten because it's a tradition that's been out, that's been overwritten or been, been yes, written but, out. But, but in a balanced way. I right. mean, uh, uh, not polemically, but. Uh, in, exactly, in, in, not uh, vindicating anything. It's mm -hmm. just that it's not the correct picture. Yeah, it's fascinating because, of course, for, for many of us, if you come, you know, my own uh, family history is like that of so many people in this room or in this museum is, uh, for Jews coming to America, it really was a kind of a golden land where they felt that they were connecting to the the history of the of the rulers, and they were mm. would end up going to Ivy League colleges, and then they would take on to some degree, with whatever ambiguity, the identity of the uh, of the overclass. But something else occurs to me as we're talking here, and that is about the gift of anonymity that New York certainly provides for all of us. Maybe it speaks, Edward, a bit to what you're talking about being able to to write here. That is that you're not. Um, uh, defined every moment and every turn by your class or clan or cohort mm -hmm. identity. I, I remember someone, you probably don't, seeing you for dinner in when you had just moved to New York. And we had seen each other in Europe over the previous 10 years uh, fairly often. And it had been a very difficult and oppressive, famously so, time of your life. Mm -hmm. And I had the sense when we got into a taxi cab in New York, you were breathing freely for yeah. the first time without disguise of any kind, I mean, overt yeah. or interior. Yeah. yeah, although, you know, I mean, as we were saying, most of the taxi drivers are from Muslim <laughs> countries. <laughs> but I've never had a problem, I have to say. Um, I wanted to say one thing about, uh, about literature and the influence, and specifically the influence of Jewish American literature. Because one of the things when I read uh, Roth, Bellow, Malamud, these writers, was I noticed the ease with which they were prepared to include other languages in an English text, you know, what Yiddish, Yiddish, for, Yiddish, for example. And, and I thought, well, I so often didn't know what these words were. You know, there's a, I, think, I think in Portnoy's complaint, um, Portnoy, at a certain point, receives what is described as a zetz in the kishkas. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, zetz? You know, <laughs> kish, what is that? You know, kishkas, where are they? <laughs> and, and you could see that it was from context that it was some kind of an assault, you know, um, rather than some kind of spice in a thing to eat, you know. So, so context made it clear. But it, I remember it gave me a kind of permission because I was trying to, to write a, a, an English about India, where people actually are also polyglot, and where all kinds of words leak into English from other languages, and that's, it's how people speak. You know, now, and obviously you can't do it on the page quite as freely as you would do it in real life, because the languages get too jumbled, you know? But mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to just, if you like, carelessly and without worrying about it, use words from other languages in English. Whereas was, in the more narrowly English tradition, mm -hmm. That, would, that was still a kind of violation. Yeah, so that, that was part of the importance of Jewish yeah. American fiction. Yeah, it just it. loosened up something in mm -hmm. me, you know, in, in, which I, in, in which I thought, well, as long as I can make things clear from context, so people can see whether it's something to eat or, or you know, or a, or a swear word or whatever, you know, as long as that's clear, then why not, you know? And, and the, the way in which I was going, which turned out to be uh, the, the way in which Midnight's Children were written, you know, was certainly helped by my reading of those writers. I find that really um, fascinating because part of the topic today was how has American fiction um, mm -hmm. influenced us. And when I was thinking about that, I was thinking, well, actually, it's reading writers like Rushdie in America that's influenced me because, you know, you got your influence. I was, inf you know, I feel that there's a sort of a chain and writing my work, I feel uh, it's okay to use Afrikaans. So in a way, being in a place where people take these chances and the people who are taking these chances are bringing in strands of their own tradition is really liberating. 
So uh, for me, the excitement isn't necessarily about reading those, you know, the writers that you think of uh, mm -hmm. as great American writers, although that's part of it. But it's writers who bring in, you know, words of Spanish, um, you know, their own languages, um, words of Yiddish, um, you know, Indian languages. So that's that's the thrill. So the the polyglot, or as my professional, my professorial friends say, the polysemic novel <laughs> is part one of the things that mm -hmm. that America. It is extremely interesting in, uh, in in several ways. But I will point out two things. One is the existence of a a type of writers who are called the Latino writers whose language is not Spanish but English and thinking of the most obvious cases like Juno Diaz but there are many, many, many others like Oscar Hijuelos won the Pulitzer Prize 18 years before and it's a whole range of literature which is enriching this country in, in an incredible way and um, in my own personal case as a writer uh, I written two things, one was the pen that uh, two or three years ago uh, when they listed my name for some event I saw Eduardo Lago US slash Spain, and I said, I don't think of that. Said, That's how they perceive me. And, and I, I was very grateful, uh, going back to that. It, it is true. And when my novel was published in France last year, it has not been published in English, it, it's in 13 languages, but not English. That's another thing. And uh, uh, the critic from Le Monde said, Eduardo Lago has no connection with the Hispanic tradition. He's not a Hispanic writer. He's an American writer who writes about New York in Spanish. True. Yeah. True. Yeah, true. Yes, it's very interesting. The, other, um, um, the tradition of people of, of writing for other languages living in New York and writing about New York is, uh, I think, is very long. And uh, we have in Cuba, we have uh, this um, very, very famous Cuban writer uh, from the 19th century, Jose Martí, who was a, a hero. And um, it was a, a very, very interesting chronicles about New York, the most important chronicles of, the, of that um, days and um, the other day uh, it was uh, reopening uh, um, a restaurant in in the village. Um, he uh, used to 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 attend them. It's, it's in a hotel, a small hotel, hotel Grifo. four. And then, but um, was, the place is also well known because um, um, Oscar Wilde used to be there and Mark Twain and many others. And we came with my uh, my uh, translator Esther, uh, Esther Allen, and we spoke with the people there and we tell them that uh, we told them that. You know, do you know that um, there is a, this place also is related to this um, famous writer, Jose Martí? I didn't know anything about Jose Martí, so we told them, and that's very interesting because Martí, for me, was also was an inspiration for com uh, uh, coming here, and um, his, his, uh, his chronicles are very, very, very interesting, and, and they were very well translated to English. Um, yeah. But it's interesting to, to find out, I am writing a novel that takes place in the 19th century, so to find out um, in 19th century New York. Yeah, uh, in New York, yes. Yeah. So I, I read his uh, chronicles and I found out that I found that they are like, wonderful. Yes. Okay. To um, uh, in September, they're going to open an exhibition in the Museum of the City of New York and in the Museo del Barrio, which is titled Nueva York. And I, you are going to be shocked at, uh, about rectifying history and the, the the history of Hispanic New York begins in the 17th century with the Sephardic Jews. Yes, that's right. Well, we'll look, we'll look forward to that. Let me open up the conversation. We have a nice, intimate Sunday afternoon audience, um, to put it euphemistically. Um, uh, but, and so we'd love to invite you all in, too. So raise a hand. Someone will bring around a microphone and ask uh, anything on topic that you like to anyone up here. Yes, hello. Thank you. I'm a Spanish player, right? Um, well, I just uh, I have a question always. Uh, why is it that uh, if you are a foreign, a foreigner, or you, you make a Spanish, but all the people in the panel there, then you, to, you have to talk about tradition, roots, and all that kind of stuff. But if you are an Anglo-Saxon American writer, you can really only talk about your individual writing, and you don't have to go on this kind of tradition, roots, cliches, and all that. Well, if I may say, I don't think that's true. I mean, I think if you had, I don't know who the Anglo-Saxon writer would be, but certainly if, you, if you're in conversation with uh, the late and much missed John Updike, one of the things that he was very involved with was what kind of wasp was he? He was a poor Dutch uh, white guy, he didn't feel he had anything in common with the New England tradition, for instance. He was a Pennsylvania writer. You know, sometimes I just speak for myself. And for instance, when I wrote Fury, I was in fact writing an anti-tradition novel. I was trying to write a novel 
about what happened the day before yesterday. You know, it was, it's a very, it was a deliberate risk to try and write a novel about the exact moment in which the novel was being written. You know, and yet make it, if I did it right, something other than just journalism. You know? mm -hmm. Whereas other times that I've written, I've been very aware of a kind of heritage and tradition and so on. Um, and I think that's true of all writers. I don't think there's a rule. You know? And I think uh, if you look at American writers, I mean, Faulkner, he's very deeply steeped in tradition. And, and uh, Eudora Welty, and, and uh, I mean, I don't, get, I, don't think, I don't think you're right. I think you're wrong. <laughs> um, let's go to somebody over here. Someone, do we have a hand up? Nobody? Be brave. Lady right here. So, um, arguably, New York is the um, center of what you might call cosmopolitanism. Could you, could you stand up and hold the microphone? Uh, arguably, New York is the center of what you might call cosmopolitanism, the place where literary connections and intellectual traditions transcend ethnicity and we're all um, made free to talk about anything by that. Cosmopolitanism and America. Is America the positive? New York. <laughs> New York particularly. All right. New York is a great cosmopolitan city. Are we putting too bright a face, too, uh, uh, too big a smile on a more complicated circumstance? No? I don't know. Anytime, anytime anybody says somewhere is the center, it makes me immediately want to argue. <laughs> You know, <laughs> um, you know I, for me, you know, this sense of identity, just to go back for a moment, um, you know, it's two questions like, who do you, ch how do people see you? And how, what choice did you make? How do you identify yourself? And how do you get seen? And I suppose cosmopolitanism is similar. It's like, who is <coughs> calling it a cosmopolitan city? And for who is it cosmopolitan? And, and you know, it's, it's a big conversation. Um, and I think all of us who have come here in our different ways and lived in different parts of the city, um, I think I've lived in all five boroughs and have had many uh, complicated, circuitous journeys. Um, it's anything but one-dimensional. And I think that word cosmopolitan sort of, you know, <laughs> reminds me of a cocktail. Um, you know, it's sort of perhaps a little, um, a little glib to describe the, the kind of uh, more Escher-like, uh, layered, uh, you know, valleys and cliffs that, you know, living in New York over a 30 year period, or I was, I was at uh, the conversation between Richard Ford and Shirley Hazard. She's lived in New York City for 60 years um, and seemed so unlike a New Yorker in any way, shape or form. Um, so for me, this question is constantly reinventing itself. Um, so I suppose cosmopolitan, yes, but perhaps each individual story in all of those millions of souls is really what intrigues me as a novelist. What I like about New York is, is I heard it from somebody is that every single day you find somebody who's much more intelligent than you, <laughs> richer, better, everything. So it's a lesson in humility every every single day. You and you find you know these wonderful people, and that's what and that makes you richer, much richer in, internally. And in the case of my own writing, besides the fact that I took that bold decision of publishing is that I think that in this case we can say, I agree with you. I was thinking, uh, Adam asked me, why are you not a, a citizen yet? And I have problems with that. I have some, it would be complicated. But I know why now. I discovered it between, in, in two, two minutes. minutes. <laughs> yeah, which is that because I would apply for New York nationality, oh. <laughs> not for American nationality. In terms of the writing, I think really that nowadays uh, I, here in this country is, uh, there's a huge amount of energy. They are renovating literature in, in ways that is not uh, is not the same in, in other places. There are great writers from India and the diaspora, etc. But I think that here this is a laboratory of ideas, and that is very very refreshing for somebody who writes in another language. In my case, I think that the best things in fiction these days are happening many of them in the United States. I, I don't want you know. I think we've all I think truthfully been speaking very affectionately about this city because. I mean, after all, you choose to live somewhere because you like living there, you know. Um, and, but I think it would be wrong to, to try and deduce from that that this is some kind of unique city on a hill, mm -hmm. New Jerusalem, whatever. I mean, I love other cities too, you know, and I really love London, for instance. And, and I think it's every bit as cosmopolitan um, as this one, as this city, but in a different way. Do, do, Let's have to take another question. I don't want to 
we'll, we'll go on. Um, I'm sorry, I can't see. Uh, gentleman, right here. Yeah, lady here. Hi, um, this is kind of a personal and, and sort of an intellectual question, but I read Shalimar the Clown a few years ago, and it was, I really enjoyed it, and I enjoyed all the references in it. And when I read the reviews of Shalimar the Clown, it felt like some of the, the reviewers weren't getting all the references or weren't fleshing them out fully. And I found in my own writing, in my own life, um, there's, there are references that I make and that are important to me from my culture, I'm Indian, um, that I can't quite explain to people at large, and I can't quite figure out how to make it relevant. And I feel like part of it is this, you know, there's a little bit of latent racism against third world cultural references. Particularly, you know, Bollywood, for instance, is very dear to me, and I can't quite explain how to make it relevant, you know, to people who are not from that culture. How, how do you struggle with that and, let me, let me broaden that question for the okay. whole panel. Are all critics idiots who miss the point <laughs> of everything you do? That's yes. A, <laughs> that's, a, that's easy. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's true, I think, that any writing contains references which people who know about the world being described will receive better than people who don't. You know, I mean, it's, it's quite true. I know that when I read Gabriel Garcia Marquez, there are many things about Latin America, which I am nuances that you would leap out at a Latin American writer, which I don't necessarily get. You know, um, the question is, are you getting enough? You know, I mean, my view is, I read Garcia Marquez. I know that there's things I'm missing, but doesn't matter because what I'm getting is so ample and full um, that I'm happy. You know? And and so I mean, I would hope that. I know that people who know about India and Pakistan, um, when they read my work, can hear echoes and pick up things uh, that people who don't know about those places may miss. So that's just how it is. If you know a place and the place is written about, you respond to it in a different way. But the question is whether those other readers are getting enough or not. If they are feeling that the reading experience is pleasurable and enlightening and informative, etc., then fine. I mean, I think, you know, I've used often this cooking analogy, which is that you stir all kinds of things into a stew, you know, and it's not necessary for the, for the eater of the stew <coughs> to be able to deconstruct it, you know, to be able to say exactly what quantity of what is in the stew. The question is whether you like the taste. You know, if you like the stew, then that's fine, even if you're not entirely able to decipher every little thing that's in there. And so I think you just accept that. I mean, I'm happy that the books get read in, by people who know about them and by, by, know about the worlds and by people who don't, you know, so. Um, up here, right there, yeah. Returning to the question of cosmopolitanism, I think that uh, New York is a city of subcultures with no dominant culture, which makes it more, which makes it quite interesting. I, I, I think the old, the old hegemony of uh, Jewish and Italian working class it, 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 it's gone, and uh, there's nothing to replace it. There's just subcultures. New York is a city of subcultures without a dominant culture. Uh, true? Anyone's experience? I don't know. I think in a way, you know, Salman, although I also had the idea of uh, speaking about centers, in a way, in New York, you find everything. And this doesn't happen necessarily in other cities, not even in Berlin, which is very cosmopolitan again these days. And I think that all the people, people like you guys, uh, all of us perhaps, we make this different. In the citation for my word in Spain, the, what they mentioned is that I had brought into Spanish language the great experimental American tradition. I, fe I, I feel if that is true, which I don't know, that would be something I would feel honored. And I, I think that going back to meeting people who are better than you every single day, that is true in the case of writers. I meet writers every day that enrich me continuously. So I, in that sense, I don't think that that is happening in Paris. I doubt it. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's true that one of the delights of New York City is this enormous proliferation of subcultures. I mean, think that's, that's true. But I think it may be a little e too easy to think that there is not a ruling class. You know, uh, because I think that there is a ruling class. Um, there, it's, it's a city dominated by money and power. 
um, and, uh, and that it, it exists. It, it's not a class system in the way that the English or the Europeans would recognize, but that doesn't mean that there isn't one, I think. I mean, there are masters of the universe here. The, the meritocracies produce, uh, produce classes as, uh, as much as uh, hereditary societies do, certainly. I guess what you're saying in part, Eduardo, and I, I do think tends to be true, is, is that um, it is, you don't have to be narrow, insular kind of patriot of New York to recognize that historically there usually is one cosmopolitan center. You mentioned Paris. Paris played that role from 1789 to 1950. That is, if wherever you were, whether you were James Joyce or Samuel Beckett or uh, coming from the French provinces, you washed up in Paris and you remade yourself as a person. You found yourself. Paris, a city I dearly love, where I lived for many years, doesn't play that role now. It's a polyglot city increasingly, but it's not a cosmopolitan city in that, in that, particular, in that particular sense. So I don't think you have to be a kind of New York chauvinist to think that it has been one of the features of Western civilization to have a cosmopolitan center changing from century to century sometimes from generation to generation, though much less recently, to recognize that at least from 1950 to the, night, to the afternoon we're speaking. And that, that is the reason why we are here. Mm -hmm. And it's like in that when you have a movie that nobody can leave the room, we cannot leave New York, even mm -hmm. if we try. Mm -hmm. Jose? Uh, yes, uh, for me, I, I think uh, so, so, uh, the, the, the feeling of, this, of cosmopolitan is very important. I think um, I have met here uh, readers from many other countries and uh, many uh, publishers who understand better uh, Latin American literature, for example, or literature from other countries than so, somewhere else. So mm -hmm. I think that the, the knowing of uh, what is co coming, how, although it's true that uh, a few books are published into English, but uh, on, the other, on the other hand, you have specialists or in uh, Almost every literature with people who know exactly what's going on in, in very old. So for me, that's, you can feel it on your, in, all news, in the papers and the review, the mm -hmm. magazines. So the, the, the cultural life is not self centered, it's also like paying attention all the time what's happening all the around the world. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that, we, you know, that this, we're using this term cosmopolitan uh, as if it was un arguably a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but there, in, this, in the recent years, there have been, there's been more than one discourse which uses it pejoratively. Mm -hmm. You know, that's to say, uh, now with the decline of Marxist theory and literary criticism, you see that that's one discourse that has diminished, but certainly, according to Marxist discourse, cosmopolitanism was problematic because it was related to deracination, it was related to, 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 you know, to, to things that were uh, criticizable. Even now, I think there's a certain, I mean, I don't want to get into post-colonial theory, but there is a, still a thing there which feels that the kind of uprooting um, of a writer from native soil, you know, is in some way a diminishing, and, and that this kind of urban experience of people living in cities by choice and writing about wherever they feel like it, there's something wrong with that. You know, so I think we have to understand that there's a problematic aspect to this. I, so. I mean, that's interesting because um, I, I just recently, there was an article in The Independent in England about the South Africa was the featured country at the London Book Fair. And um, they listed, uh, you know, all the South African writers, you know, new writers with, um, you know, dealing with completely different issues than were dealt with during apartheid South Africa. And then they mentioned a group of South African writers or writers who write about South Africa, like myself, um, who live outside of the country. And the last line was, it's questionable how South African they are. So I've been thinking these last few weeks, or, you know, do you, when you leave the country of your birth, do you, does, your, does that drain out of you, that original sense of rootedness? Um, and I've been struggling with that idea, and I, I, I sort of turned to Eudora Welty, and uh, you know her, her piece, Place and Fiction, and she talks about um, the home tie, the blood tie, um, you know, the home tie is the blood tie. So uh, for me, that, that does still feel true, that there's that incredible connectedness. And I've been asking writers at this festival, in fact, um, I was on a panel with Siri Hustvedt, and I said to her, you know, you, you came back and forth between um, here and Norway, and you speak Norwegian, do you feel... Um, Norwegian American. She said, as I get older, I feel more Norwegian. So I think it's, you know, it's again one of those moments where people, is it a question of what people um, label you as, how you see yourself? Um, 
you know, it's, 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 it's very tricky and awkward because I think certainly with regard to South African fiction at the moment, um, you know, people are dealing with, uh, you know, difficult social situ you know, and political ills, um, you know, on the ground. And I'm here um, with a completely different perspective and often a, a historical perspective or perspective that goes somewhere else completely. Um, and luckily, they've been, the South Africans have been very generous with my work and really have, you know, welcomed it. Um, but there is that, that constant nagging question, well, do you lose? Does this, this sense of who you are, does that leave you over time? Perhaps that's a question we could all talk about. Well, there's certainly there's a discourse in Indian literature about the difference between the Indian writers who live in India and those who, 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 in live, who, who live abroad, you know, and there's a, a, a constant, you know, polemic, if you like, you know, about that, um, which varies in heat at different times. Um, I mean, I remember being at a dinner given for a group of Indian writers at a, a literary festival, and, and an Indian woman writer who I will not name um, was sitting next to me, suddenly, apropos of nothing, leaned towards me and she said, of course, your position in Indian literature is highly problematic. <laughs> <laughs> this was with the first course or with it? <laughs> and I said, really? And she said, yes, highly. <laughs> Let me, so, so there's that. There's you know? Let me take one last quick question, and then I'm afraid we have to stop. Um, right, lady right here in the aisle. I, I had in mind the other lady, but oh. we'll give it to no. We'll have no, no. This is fine. I'm sure we'll have an even better oh, question surrender, from the lower from the lower end. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, I, I'm in a way trying to bring this back full circle. We, you began by talking about the dream of New York versus the reality of New York, and it seems to me that there are a lot of people for whom New York is a dual reality in many ways. And it's a reality that confronts people on almost, ev almost every day when you take the time to think about it. There's the reality of the rich and the poor, the reality of the, the beautiful and the grungy. And you, you know, we can go on forever right, let, like that. Let, let, I'm sorry, we're running, let, can I stop you there and say, yeah. that, is that your question for the, the, well that's a good last place I think for all of us to reflect. Uh, a dual reality of New York, uh, is this something we all experience? Is this part, a central part of the condition of exile, emigration, uh, the necessary f uh, features? Anybody? Well, I, say, I would say it's true of maybe of, of every city that it exists partly as a thing you have to deal with every day and partly as a thing in your mind, a thing in your imagination. You know, and I, I mean, in the, it's very, I mean, I was coming to New York for years and years before I had my own place here, there's no question that it's one of the most annoying cities to live in in the world at the level of interacting with its official manifestations. It's unbelievably difficult, you know, how, how hard it is to deal with the business of life in New York, you know, um, and, and infuriates me. And, yeah, you know, it's... it's uh, we were saying before about you know how you have a steam bath and an ice box and if you're lucky you have a good month or two in between. Um, it's a, I mean it's perfectly possible to trash the place you know, uh, but the but the fact is that certainly for me I wake up in the morning I go to the corner buy the paper and a cup of coffee and I feel in a good mood. You know it's not about anything more complicated than that. I like it, you know and 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 so the stuff I don't like I don't like but the but but. The, 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 sit, the dream city, it's still there, it's still there, you know? And I think that's true of people who've been born and raised here, it's still there. I suppose, and quickly, I, just briefly, I suppose I wanted to comment on what, what Eduardo yeah. said about the fact that you, if you, you know, a person with a lot of inner turmoil, <laughs> you come to a city where there's so, much so many manifestations of turmoil and you feel at peace. <laughs> so for me that, yes. I, I really uh, found the a real kinship with that. Statement. Your inner calm is projected <laughs> outward by the, the outward disturbance all around you. Well, one day I was with a friend who came from Spain and I was walking him around the city and, and he said to me, how can you live in such an ugly city? So, and I looked around and I said, is it ugly? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I realized he was right. And the weather, the same thing. Today is steamy, yesterday <laughs> it's it's freezing. Constantly, but nobody leaves. 
Somebody once said that uh, a skunk is not a worse smell than other smells, it's just more smell than other smells. And New York may not be a worse or better city than other cities, but it is more city, perhaps, than any other city. And I hope we've touched on everything from the cosmopolitan ideal to the nagging realities of identity here. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you all, Saman and Jose Adriano.